and welcome to Food in the Capital Web Bites. Today we welcome Robert D. Costella, AO, MBE, to our Web Bites series. Known and highly respected around the world as one of Australia's greatest sporting legends, Robert's illustrious career dominating the marathon circuits around the world resulted in him being voted world's best marathoner of the 1980s, Australian of the Year in 1983, inductee into the Australian Sporting Hall of Fame in 1986, and named World Marathon Runner of the Decade by Track and Field News in 1990. Never one to sit on his laurels, as director of the AIS, Robert was involved in the establishment of the elite sports system used today, repositioned the AIS as a centre of excellence, established Smart Kids for Kids, sorry, Smart Start for Kids, and Smart Start Life for Adults and Corporations, both of which have been accredited for significant improvements in creating better health and reducing obesity, contributed to the recovery of the ACT region after the 2003 fires and established a premium health food brand, Deeks Health Foods, in 2005. And that is only a tiny summary of all the things that Robert has done. Robert, welcome and thank you for your time. Uh, absolute pleasure, Sir Suzanne. So, Robert, what inspired you after doing so much, instead of sitting back and relaxing, <laughs> what inspired you to establish a food business? Well, um, um, I guess a lot of the work that I've, I've done has been in the health sector. You know, obviously, as, a, as an elite athlete, um, I was very much focused at just trying to be the best in the world. Uh, but then, you know, sort of working at the AIS um, and... Uh, the thing you didn't touch on is the Indigenous Marathon Foundation, which I've been doing now for 10 years as well, uh, really focuses on both the physical health and the mental health of, um, of our community. And um, exercise is, is one side of the coin, but uh, what you eat is, is the other side. And sort of in between is your, your mental health and your, and your well-being. So um, I really think that food is, is vitally important to, um, you know, sort of avoiding chronic disease, you know, all of the major chronic diseases, uh, but it's also really important for fulfilling your, your, your potential in life. And uh, I guess, you know, that's certainly something that I've tried to do all the way through my life, you know, as, as an athlete trying to fulfill my potential as a, as a marathon runner, um, at the AIS trying to support the the young up and coming and, and elite athletes to reach their full potential. And, um, and also, you know, sort of uh, in a management role, trying to support and nurture staff to, to enable them to reach their potential. And, uh, and food is such an important part of that. Um, the other major contributor was um, getting to know a good friend of mine. One of my best friends now is a, immunobiologist, a clinical immunobiologist here in Canberra, Bill Giles. And, uh, you know, Bill and I have been good mates now for, you know, sort of nearly 25 years. Um, and he, he sort of uh, made me aware of a lot of the, uh, the health issues that tend to be linked to, to people who have compromised immune systems and still continue to eat uh, wheat, rice and corn and other grains. Um, you know, my wife being one of them, my wife, struggled with chronic fatigue when she was younger for a, a, a long part of her life. And it's only really by going off all of the, the grains. Um, so, you know, everyone knows about gluten and, um, and wheat, but, um, but also looking at some of the other grains. So I really wanted to work with Bill to provide a, a platform for more people both to be aware of the, the, the risks and the benefits, the risks of, of eating grains if you have any sort of compromised autoimmune um, system, but also the benefits of avoiding them. And one of the challenges in, in cutting out all of the grains is that a lot of people think there's not much else to eat. And because bread is so, sort of such a staple part of our diet, uh, you know, back in, in 2005, you know, Bill, Bill and myself and a couple of others and my wife got together and and uh, thought you know, let's see whether we can pioneer and and develop some uh, some breads that don't use any grains and uh, and that's where we we started and uh, you know we started in a little a little suburban uh, what was a, a little cafe or a little restaurant in Pierce down here on the south side of Canberra uh, just as a, a bit of a 
uh, a pilot to, to see whether whether it was possible to make breads without using grains. And um, and you know, fortunately, we we were successful, and now we've we've grown and really uh, we've had a couple of cafes and uh, and restaurants, but now we're really focusing on the wholesaling and the retail mail ordering side of the business. Amazing. So slightly off the track, the food pyramid, when you're talking about grains and everything, I remember in school, the food pyramid. Now grains are actually in that food period, quite a large part of that. How did it, uh, what inspired somebody to actually think outside something that was literally pushed into our brains from year dot? What inspired somebody to actually think outside that square, that, well, that triangle actually, it, that's a, a really amazing feat in its own. Yeah, look, the, the, the famous food pyramid is a, uh, a wonderful marketing uh, exercise by which was developed by the US grain industry. So, so you know, back back in the in the in the uh, the seventies and the eighties, there was the big push for the low fat, high carbohydrate diet, and uh, and now and obviously that's very good if you happen happen to be a farmer, a grain farmer, or a, a grain seller. Um, but uh, but now I think there's a much greater realization that uh, that some of those high carbohydrate foods are not necessarily the best foods that we should be eating. And even, you know, CSIRO and other major food, food organisations, science organisations are actually coming out and, uh, and starting to acknowledge that a low carbohydrate and, uh, and a higher consumption of, of fats and protein is a much better way for us to go and really trying to eliminate and get off all of the, the sugars or a lot of the sugars. So, um, so you know, the, yeah, the, the food pyramid was a, a wonderful, wonderful marketing tool by, developed by the American grain industry. <laughs> <laughs> well, four points to them. It worked well. <laughs> so it sure did. Tell... Yeah, people still talk about it. <laughs> I know. When you were talking, I'm thinking, wait a minute. <laughs> I remember learning about the food pyramid. This is great. It actually tips it on its head, so to speak. So what are the challenges yeah. when starting a premium food range? That would have to have some major challenges in its own. Oh, look, absolutely. And especially a pioneering food. Uh, you know, like I said, no one had ever made bread without using any grain. So, you know, we don't use any wheat. We don't use any rice. We don't use any corn or barley or oats or rye. Uh, all of those grains come from the family of, of grasses and uh, and they grow prolifically and they are wonderful sources of uh, survival food, but they're not necessarily the sorts of foods that we should be eating on a regular basis. You know, if you look at our evolution as mankind, um, you know, our, our, our uh, biology hasn't really changed over hundreds of thousands of years. Um, but the food as an agricultural society, we've only really been farmers for the last 10,000 years. And that's not long enough really for our, our DNA and our bodies and our biology to, to change. So um, the, the grains, uh, the wheat, rice and corn um, are wonderful crops, but they're a monocrop, a little bit like a, a pine forest. So, you know, nothing else grows in a pine forest, um, but they have really strong natural defense chemicals that prevent the uh, insects from eating them and the, and the molds and the fungi and, and all of those things, all of the pests. But um, when, we eat, when we eat them, when we ingest them, our immune system has to work extra hard to, to break down those natural plant defense chemicals. And if you're young and you're healthy and you know, you're, you're, everything's going, going great guns, then, then your immune system is in good, good condition. But as we get older, uh, our immune system picks up little scars or little holes and it doesn't qu work quite as well as what it used to. And therefore, we've got to be a little bit more disciplined and a little bit more cautious about what we eat. Uh, like I said, you know, everyone knows about gluten, uh, but a lot of people aren't aware of some of the other health issues, some of the other symptoms of arthritis and headaches and bloatedness and, um, you know, other, other more serious uh, ways that your immune system can be compromised. So, um, you know, we, we, we pioneered uh, grain-free bakery products back, you know, back 15 years ago. And, um, and one of the big challenges for us and, uh, you know, sort of puts us in that premiumization category is that the ingredients we use, and one of the main ingredients is quinoa uh, that has become really popular in the last five or 10 years. 
Uh, but 15 years ago, hardly anyone had heard of quinoa. And, uh, and you know, we, we really started to, to pioneer the use of quinoa and, and used to mill our own quinoa seeds and turn it into flour and, and everything. But it does come at a price. Uh, so there's no doubt that our, all of our products and our breads especially are, are much, much more expensive uh, than a lot of the other wheat and, and grain-based breads. But, um, but, you know, there are a lot of people who, who really are prepared to invest into, um, into their, their health and well-being, and, um, you know, they can feel the, the real benefit of that. There has been a um, gluten-free and has become a, a bit of a, almost a fashion trend in some circles. I've noticed that um, in the early days of catering, people, uh, the, uh, the idea of getting a gluten-free order was unusual. And talking to caterers today, there's actually quite a large demand, people asking for gluten-free foods. What do you attribute this shift to? Is it just a general acknowledgement about health or is there something else behind this movement? Oh, look, you're spot on, Suzanne. I mean, you know, the the uh, the medical um, doctors will tell us that only about three percent or five percent of the population have the uh, the celiac gene. Uh, but what we're finding now is that people between 25 and 30, uh, 33 percent, between a quarter and a third of people are actually choosing to buy gluten-free products. And um, the reason is that it makes them feel better. <laughs> you know, you just, you have more energy. Uh, you don't have those same, those same irritating symptoms that you've been, you know, sort of putting up with for years and years. Um, so, so I think, you know, basically people are just investing more into, into looking after themselves. And I think that's one of the things that we've seen over, over the last uh, six months or so, especially, you know, since the pandemic hit, that people are starting to realise that you've got to look after yourself. You know, you've got to look after your mental health and, and everyone is really focusing on, you know, social connections and staying in touch and getting the exercise and, and looking after yourself. And, and like I said very much at the start, uh, food is a really critical part of how you can look after yourself. And people are now prepared to make the effort and, and you know, invest into getting the gluten-free foods and the options because uh, because it makes them feel better. So have you seen any other, uh, you've obviously been studying for food for quite some time and been into this for quite some time. Have you seen any other changes in food trends since the since you started the, um, the Smart Start Food for, what was that, 2004? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, Deke, Deke started about 2005. So we've been going for 15, 16 years now. Um, and, and, you know, obviously the gluten-free is a big, a big factor and there are a whole host of others, you know, even things like the paleo diets. And we touched on the, the, uh, the shift in uh, away from high carbohydrate uh, type diets and the emphasis on low fat, high carbohydrate is now, is now being uh, debunked. Um, and people are starting to realize that as a, as a species, fat, fat has always been a really important part of our diet. And, and a lot of people have problems with their health, not from eating the fat, but it's actually combining it with the high carbohydrate at the same time. So it's really, you know, much, you're much better off trying to keep your insulin levels down low uh, by, by trying to minimize the amount of sugar and carbohydrate that you're, that you're eating and trying to turn your body into uh, a fat burning machine that reduces the, the hunger that you have and the cravings, you know, uh, working with a lot, lot of our Indigenous runners now, um, you know, they come from an, a, a, a history of, of high fat diets in their old, in a couple of hundred years ago. But now with the, our, our white man diets coming in, there's a big shift over towards the high carbohydrate uh, foods for them. And, um, and, and because they've only been exposed to our, our Western diets for a relatively short period of time, you know, less than a couple of hundred years, um, they, they find, I think that the symptoms and the health problems that they're experiencing are, are quite, quite significant. And trying to get them back to, um, you know, sort of eating, you know, it's like a little bit of a, of a putting newspaper on a fire is a little bit like eating a high carbohydrate diet. You're always hungry and you're always 
you know, sort of restricting the number of calories that you're, that you're eating, as opposed to, to putting a, a nice hardwood log on a fire. And that's sort of your, your, your fat and your protein. And it takes a little bit longer for, for the hard log to catch a light, but once it's actually burning, it'll burn all night. And, uh, and that's why you know, we're, we're trying to encourage people to, to look a little bit more beyond just the, um, you know, some of the, the messaging that's been out there through the 60s and, uh, and get back to the sort of the ancestral type of, of, uh, of foods. And the, and the breads that we produce use a lot of the, the natural seeds and, and legumes and, um, uh, and, and other plants that don't have the, the same defence chemicals that a lot of the grains have. I love the analogy. The next time you reach for a block of chocolate, <laughs> make up your mind whether you want to be that newspaper or the hardwood. It makes it pretty easy, doesn't it? That's right, yeah. <laughs> it's very hard to stop at one, one little square, isn't it? <laughs> oh, yeah, I can't. I'm, I'm just following the hardwood theory from now on. I love it. <laughs> so obviously COVID would have had a massive impact on your business because you did sell a lot to the retail market. How did you pivot and what were the major lessons you took from that? Yeah, look, it, it certainly has been really, really challenging. I mean, we lost all of our, um, our, our sales to, to the local cafes and, and restaurants and, uh, and they were a really significant uh, customer for, for us. Um, so, you know, we've really had to focus on trying to build our, our retail mail order customers and uh, we've invested a bit into our social media strategy and really trying to emphasize the, the benefits of, uh, of premium gluten-free and, and a premium uh, food product. Um, and I think that's, that's starting now to, to pay a little bit of, of dividends. We've um, upgraded our, our website or we've replaced it with a brand new website and, um, and driving, driving the messaging through social media has been a, another really big factor for us. Um, you know, unfortunately, we have had to cut back on on our staffing. You know, we've got a, a little a little um, factory out at Fishwick, and um, it's been really tough on our on our staff because we've had to reduce the number of hours working out there because of the, the drop in in sales. But um, but we're still we're still pushing forward. Um, you know, one of the other big problems or challenges for for us here in Canberra is that uh, having a, a premium product that's produced locally here, and especially the breads that are a perishable product, the, uh, the shipping and, and getting our products to the larger markets is a real, is a real challenge. So the, the Sydney and Melbourne markets, you know, we, we can do next day deliveries, but, um, but when you, you start to uh, have to add on the, the, the shipping costs then onto an already fairly expensive product, it does, it does make it a little bit more challenging. So we really do need to demonstrate the, the value and the benefits the, of our products to, to our customers to, to justify the, the additional costs. Um, as we're now starting to war, uh, head into the warmer months, um, we have to really focus on, again, on the distribution because, um, because of the delays and the and the demands on on the uh, transport system at the moment, um, you know, we we can't afford to have our products turn up to our customers and and have suffered because of they they've been sitting in the back of a hot van for for a day or so. Um, so so there are some real just logistical challenges for for us that we're continuing to to work through to to get our great products to to our wonderful customers. That's actually an issue that is um, at the heart of many of the businesses, particularly the fresh food businesses that are local small businesses and that produce premium brands. I hear that problem all the time. Um, and I guess that's probably the greatest challenge in amongst all of those businesses. Um, in terms of shifts required for to manage those challenges, are there anything other any other ideas apart from the fact that we really need to restructure and look at our logistics and perhaps have some government backing to logistics to be able to support this and move it up to the next level, particularly when we're looking at lower miles and, and local foods and things like that? Yeah, look, um, we've you know we've got a, a a business plan that we've developed now over the last year or so um, that still maintains our 
our head production facility here in Canberra and our head office here in Canberra and to uh, expand the, the long shelf life for grocery products. So in addition to breads, we do um, a whole range of, of biscuits and pasta and, uh, and gluten and grain free flours. Um, and, and then we have a, a whole, a whole um, a suite of, of sweet and, and savoury foods as well, pies and, past, and sausage rolls and, and other things. But our, our grocery lines, we want to increase the production here, but we're looking to, in the process of uh, seeking capital to uh, establish some interstate production facilities for, for our perishable breads, for our, our, uh, the products that we really do need to, to produce and deliver fresh to, to the, the customers and to the, uh, the food industry. So, so that's something that we're, we're exploring at the moment. Um, and, and, you know, sort of, as I said, we're out, out in the market at the moment trying to, to find some investment partners to, to help us to do that. So what's your advice to anyone else who wants to enter the premium food brand? Because it sounds like it's something that requires um, a lot of pivoting, even in a non-COVID season. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, you, you really, you do really do need to have a point of difference, and um, and then you need to be able to, um, you know, sort of back up your promise. Um, you know, sort of for us, because we've been pioneering the the grain free industry and the grain free bakery products, especially, the big challenge is uh, is coming up with the technology and the and the methodology to be able to produce those premium products. And, and then for us to ensure that every single customer that, that receives our products, uh, you know, it lives up, our products live up to the promise that we're making. Um, and, and that can be a, a challenge when, when we're a relatively small, uh, a small business. You know, we, we don't have massive automation. Uh, we still very, very much rely on the, on the skills and the, and the abilities of our, our our bakers and our pastry chefs to be able to do that, and um, and still rely on our wholesale customers to be able to ensure that they they look after the product so that they they are selling the the best quality products to to our customers. Um, you know, if a customer gets a, a product that they're not happy with, very rarely do they actually uh, blame the the shop that they bought it from. Uh, it's it's seen as as a as a Deeks issue, not not necessarily the retailer's issue, and so what we need to do is to ensure that uh, that all of our retailers uh, understand how to look after our products to ensure that when the customer does get them, that they they are getting the very best products that um, that they've ever had in their lives. And we have wonderful feedback from so many of our customers um, who who are just blown away by uh, the fact that we're able to produce these products that. Uh, and a lot of them, you know, aren't aren't um, uh, celiac, or they're, they're just they just love the the taste of our Deeks products. So, uh, and, and I think that's a, a great testament. In the old days, if you had a gluten free badge on your on your product, it was immediately considered to be uh, inferior or taste like cardboard or polystyrene. Uh, the whole food industry has has really moved ahead. And, uh, and people now are actually deliberately going out seeking the gluten-free option. And for us to work in the premium gluten-free space, uh, we really do need to, to deliver on that promise. Well, I can certainly vouch for it. It is delicious. Now, before I let you go, I would love to, and I'm sure the other listeners would love to hear a little bit more about your Indigenous Marathon program. <laughs> Uh, sure. Look, um, yeah, look, yeah, it's, it's something I'm very proud of. I mean, uh, and it's been going now for 10 years. This is our 10th our year and we work with young Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island men and women, mainly in that 18 to 30 year bracket uh, right across Australia. And we, uh, we select about 12, six men and six women each year and, uh, and train them for about six months. Uh, and then we would normally take them over to New York and they would run the New York City Marathon. Um, along the way, they also do a, uh, an education component, a, a cert for in business and a level one run coaching certificate and uh, first aid and CPR and mental health, Indigenous mental health first aid certificate. So there's a, a significant education component in there as well. 
And um, uh, over the last 10 years, we've got 96 uh, young Aboriginal and Torres Strait men and women who finished a major international marathon. And they become our, our IMP graduates. And then we work with them as a charity. We're a, um, you know, a, a tax deductible uh, um, a charity. So we raise funds to be able to then provide them with scholarships and grants and mentoring. To, to go on as young as young leaders in their families and in their communities. Uh, so we're, I head into Alice Springs uh, at the end of this week, and because of COVID, we can't go to, to New York. Um, so we've still got a, a, an amazing group of 12 runners from across the country that will be coming into Alice Springs. And um, on the 31st, Saturday, the 31st of October, they'll be running a marathon in the desert outside of Alice Springs. Uh, and because it's gonna be pretty hot up there this time of the year, they're, they're starting their marathon at 10 o'clock at night. So they'll be running at nighttime under a full moon through, through the desert on the outskirts of Alice Springs. And, uh, and for each and every one of these young men and women who have had a really uh, challenging experience over the last six months to get through the training, coming from tiny little remote and isolated communities right across the country to the major cities and, and country regions. Um, I'm really looking forward because I haven't even met them yet other than on Zoom this year. So this will be the first time uh, this coming weekend when I actually get to meet them face to face and sit down and, um, and, and find out how we can support them through their marathon um, and then support them beyond that. You know, we say the finish line of your marathon is your start line. And we want to be able to support them to continue to step up as, as real agents and drivers of positive change in their families and in their communities. That is absolutely awesome. And I can't think of anything more amazing than running across Northern Territory is just so beautiful. And running across the land under moonlight would just be the most amazing experience. So well done. I would actually enjoy that more than doing the Boston Marathon. That is just, the, the image just blows me away. Great initiative. Well, look, thank you so much for your time, Deeks. Huge fan. And everyone, please go and have a look at the Deeks Health Food online. Great stuff. And go and support the Indigenous Marathon. Thank you so much. Thanks very much, Suzanne. All right. Mm -hmm.